I'm Bill Castle, and this is Free Expression. This program is all about conveying the Christian message from a Catholic point of view and defending the liberty which makes it possible to do that. We talk with creative, interesting people about Catholic entrepreneurship, what your clothes say about your faith, and an attempt to restructure the church. Join us. Sit back and enjoy some free expression. If there's one thing the Catholic Church is good at, it's creating obscure language. For 2,000 years, theologians have come up with terms that have ultra-precise meanings, but which very few people seem to understand. Lately, we've been hearing the word synod. According to the dictionary, a synod is a council or a meeting. Well, the church is holding a synod, a meeting of bishops, to be called the Synod on Synodality. This event is supposed to focus on what? Meetings? It's all very confusing. And of course, there's much more to it. This synod on synodality has important implications for the future of our faith. John Horvat of the organization Tradition, Family, and Property is here to explain it. John, thanks very much for being with us. It's great to be on the show. Let's start with the basics. What do terms like synodality and synodal process mean? Yes, that's uh, that's a good question because it is this is something very recent. Nobody has used the word synodality before. Synod, of course, is by definition a council of bishops, and uh, already here we have some problems because this synod on synodality is not a council of bishops, because it will have, for the first time in church history, laymen and laywomen voting on the issues. But synodality is something that is novel language. It doesn't even appear in, in it doesn't appear in canon law or Vatican II documents. It's a way of being the people of God. That's how they sort of they define it. It's expression that has no history. It just it seeks to make pastoral decisions that reflect the will of God and supposedly through the voice of the Spirit through the assembly. This particular assembly. What is that that this whole thing is about? What are they going to be talking about? Yes, yes, and uh, yes, you, as you mentioned in the introduction, it is a synod on synodality. It's it's a meeting about meetings, and that doesn't <laughs> quite make a lot of sense to Americans. It's pretty circular logic. But what it is is, you know, they're going to talk, be talking about a lot of issues, and some of them are the hot button, button issues of homosexuality, blessings, same-sex unions, women deacons, the priesthood, the women priests. Uh, These are the hot button issues that are going to be, some of them are going to be discussed, but the most important thing they're going to be discussed is 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 a manner of governing the church a change in the manner of governing the church. So that's what has, got, has, has made a lot of people concerned, because the church is governed by bishops, the pope, or the bishops, and, uh, you know, and, and, the, and the clergy, and the laity as well. You know, it's, it's a very structured, pyramidical structure of, of how things can get, get done, and it's a very efficient, actually, very, very efficient way of organizing and proclaiming the Word of God. So this is what uh, the, the sin on synodality is discussing, changing those structures. And I think that's the, probably the most important thing, you know, that this, this change of structures to invert the, paragr- the pyramid, uh, to introduce democratization and local synods and parish synods where the spirit speaks, yet can also contradict itself. So it, I, that's why I think a lot of people are very concerned. Is there any power in, implied here? Is, is this going to be an advisory thing, or can they actually bring influence on, on changing this structure of authority? They are talking about, these are the things they will be talking about to make it, to, make it, to not make it a consultatory, uh, you know, a consultation body, but a deliberative body, a governing body. Uh, these are the, these, this is an issue they're talking about. Obviously, in this particular, this Senate, I'm not saying they will, you know, it will be an executive body or one that will execute things and have that power, but it is on the table. Uh, this this particular synod will obviously have to go through uh, the, have to be approved by Pope uh, Francis the first, 
And it is one synod, and they're going to have another synod on synodality one year from now. So there, it's, it is a, a ongoing process. And at the end of that next year, then we will have a document, and that document will define you know, what's, what's going to happen. Well, if they come across with some sort of proposed new constitution for the church, what would happen then? Would it have to be approved by a, by a, an actual council, a new Vatican II, if you will? Would it have to be okayed by the Pope? What would be the long-term process here and the implication? In this particular case, since it is a synod, and synods uh, have existed in the past, that deliberate on, do- on, on doctrinal problems and uh, doctrinal issues, the Pope, at the end, he does make a decision. And that decision has a magisterial implications. That is to say, it is it is incorporated into the body of doctrine of the church. So, yes, uh, it would it would not necessitate a Vatican III. It would only it, it in itself has certain as a certain importance, and you know it's it, it that, that that's how it it would come come about. This all sounds pretty fundamental to me. I mean, you're talking about a basic reimagining of how the church should exist. Uh, <laughs> the possibility of a, of a radical departure seems uh, quite real. Right. Yeah, and that's why. I mean, I have I've been involved in uh, our organization has you know been involved in in putting together a book called the Synodal Process is a Pandora's Box because that's what it is a Pandora's Box. Uh, once you open it. Anything can happen, and we are very concerned. Of course, the church will survive. I mean, the church has the promise of Christ that it will, the gates of hell will not prevail against it, but this is pretty serious stuff. A lot of uh, Protestant denominations have these kinds of deliberative bodies, and they frequently make changes in their basic set of beliefs, their catechisms, and what have you. Uh, this would be, a, a, it seems to me, a rather uncatholic vision. Yes, even, uh, you know, in fact, we cite some Anglican bishops, so there have been about 10 or 12 that have converted to the Catholic faith over the last uh, decade or so, who say, uh, yeah, we've seen this before. <laughs> Don't go that path, yeah. because that is exactly what's going on, is you, you, when you take a synodal approach, as the Anglican Church did, Pretty much in the in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, it changed the whole the whole dynamics of what happened inside the church. And a lot of Orthodox churches are also based on the synodal model. And you have the same problems. You have those internal struggles. You have those fights and those those uh, and, and just a chaos inside the church. Well, would you care to prognosticate about how this is going to unfold? I assume there's going to be a lot of argument and contention over many many points. What's your take on the final result of this? I don't know. I think we we definitely have to be involved. You know, we have to uh, have, make our our concerns known, and that's why we published this book that has a foreword by Cardinal Burke to say, well, normal Catholics need to know what's going on so that they can raise up their voices and at least get some to get their concerns. As to what will happen October fourth to the October twenty ninth when the actual synod takes place. There is a lot of resistance to this. There are something like 103 prelates who have come out against synodal path uh, theologies and raised the very concerns. So I'm not the only one, you know, you're, you know, that's coming out as a layman that doesn't have, you know, any standing. There are actually a lot of a lot of priests and bishops and even cardinals who have, who have said that, you know, Cardinal Burke, Napier, Pell, Ruini, Zen. You know, a lot of these have come out and said, we, you know, we, we need to, uh, we, we definitely need to resist this. And, and so I would hope that they would get involved, and some, a lot, some of these people will be in the Senate. I really don't know what will happen. It's, it is a Senate behind closed doors, so we won't be seeing the proceedings. Well, how can people find out about the book? The book is available at the website at tfp.org, tfp.org. Just go to the site. On the right-hand corner, you'll see Store. Just click on Store, and there it'll, it'll appear right away. You can just pick up a digital copy for free, or you can buy the actual copy for 1095. 
John Horvat, Tradition, Family, and Property. Well, thank you very much for taking time to talk about this. This is something that has serious implications for how our faith will be pursued and uh, be interesting, to say the least, <laughs> to watch how this yes. whole thing unfolds. Yes, absolutely. I think, and, and to pray, because uh, the Holy Spirit is with us. I mean, we have, the, we have these promises. We need to pray. God will keep the church safe. When it comes to people's attitudes about Mass, there are lots of disagreements. Catholics fuss over the music, over receiving communion in the hand, over lay Eucharistic ministers, the list goes on. One issue around which there seems to be a growing consensus, for better or worse, is how people dress in worship. Gone are the days when we troubled to show up in our Sunday best now jeans and tank tops prevail. Well, not everybody is sanguine about this trend. One of the most vocal critics is Sarah Kane, otherwise known as the Crusader Gal. Sarah is a writer, a blogger, and a producer of numerous popular online videos on various political and cultural topics. She recently wrote a piece for Catholic Answers in which she made a heartfelt plea for an upgrade in our appearance. Sarah, thanks for being with us. Oh, well, thank you for the invitation. I appreciate it. You raised the provocative point that what we wear in Mass says something about what we believe. What kind of messages are modern Catholics conveying through their clothes? Unfortunately, I think that too many are conveying the point that this, that this doesn't matter, that the Mass doesn't matter, that it's not something to really be concerned about, it's not something to dress respectfully at. I mean, there are a lot of people who will dress worse for the Mass than for any other function that they attend. If they were going out to any function, if they were going to work, they would dress better. And I think that if you really give that some thought, it presents the obvious indication that the person does not care and does not think that it's a place of respect. And really, maybe some people just haven't given this any thought, and that's and literally, their choice is simply thoughtlessness. But if they had a good thought, it's really kind of disturbing. I think that there are people who aren't thinking through what it is that they're doing, and they should, because how we dress really does, it denotes respect. Just as how when you go to a place of work or a business meeting, something like that, you would dress out of respect, you would dress formally. Well, to the same degree, you would think that you would want to offer that same respect to God, who is there in the tabernacle. I've heard this debated for years, and, I, and, and I've been on the receiving end of a variety of excuses. People will say, well, isn't it better that they show up in church at all? Or what does it matter? What does God care about what they look like? Maybe they've just come from work. Maybe they're just going to work. I live in a rural area, and one of the favorites is uh, maybe they've just come in from their fields. How do you respond to these various rationales? I think that perhaps what we should do, instead of just looking at other people's uh, tires so much, I think what I'm trying to implore people is to look at their own uh, and to, to figure out an eye dressing in a way that indicates that I'm giving respect to God, that I'm giving my best to God, I'm eye-dressing in a way that if a child should look at me, they would say, you know, this is obviously an important place for this person. They obviously believe that something important is happening here at the Mass. I think that in the vast majority of cases when people are dressing this way on a Sunday morning, on, on God's Day, if you will, they're not doing it because... This is the best that they can do. And ultimately, that's what I'm imploring people to do. As you say, Bill, this has been an enduring conversation over the decades. And I think that some people get a little too caught up in the, in the question of you know, how many inches should the skirt be from the ankle, that kind of thing. <laughs> and I'd rather focus less on that and focus on the are we giving it our best. Doesn't this reflect a cultural trend in general? It seems to me that we've become so casual in, in every way, in our appearance and the way we comport ourselves. We've elevated concerns like comfort and convenience, turning them into sort of moral imperatives on their own. I think that's true. I do think that people have become 
more casual overall, but I think that's actually an indication of a type of self-worship that's become common in our society. So it's essentially a, a matter of people not being willing to offer respect to a place of importance, for example, but instead saying, I will wear what I want, or I will wear what I feel comfortable in. And if that's sweatpants, so be it. Um, I think that's what it is. I think it's a matter of them surrendering what other people care about uh, for, for, for themselves, essentially. It, it really is a negative sign because if a person wishes to show respect, there are multiple ways they can do that. And the way that they speak to an individual, if you go to the mass or that you genuflect, that's an expression of respect. And also the way that we dress. And if we're not willing to, to do these things, to, to change ourselves, right, to to, to put the effort in to show any respect, I think it's a sign of, of some degree of self-worship, certainly placing the self above anyone else. Hmm. Now, anybody listening to your criticism here might jump to the conclusion that you're a very straight-laced person and that you uh, had a sort of Victorian upbringing, but actually you've, uh, you've had a kind of interesting personal journey. Tell me about your background. Yeah, I, I certainly did not have the standard religious upbringing, unfortunately. I mean, I, I want that for people. I want them to, you know, to have married parents who can instill the, the correct moral values. Unfortunately, I didn't have that. I was raised initially by a single mother. And then uh, she passed away when I was six years old. And then I bounced around from, you know, from house to house. And I was raised as an atheist. I, I found my way to Christ originally at 15 to the Anglican Church, but I was only converted to the Catholic Church a couple of years ago. So I'm a pretty, a pretty new convert, and I'm just really grateful to have been called, called to Rome. Tell me about your work as the Crusader Gal. What is this array of social commentaries that you produce? I wanted to remind people of a time when people were willing to fight for the faith, even die for the faith. I think that we live in a time where people too often think that Christians shouldn't even speak, that they should just sit down and be quiet, that they should keep their faith to themselves, that we should separate entirely our private from our, you know, our public from our religious lives, and that faith has no business inside of anything else. And there's, there's no reason to, to speak up for what it is that you believe. And I like to remind people there was a time when people, people really did. And that it, that it was a good thing, frankly, that we wouldn't even have a civilization today if those people weren't willing to stand there and say, no, these Muslim marauders can't go any further, for example. And, and so that's why I started using the Crusader Gal moniker. And throughout my work, so I do um, both writing and also video work. I produce uh, YouTube videos, and I write for, obviously, Catholic Answers, also Crisis Magazine, and my own Substack. But throughout all of these different mediums, what I'm trying to do is remind people that there was a Christendom, that they can still be, that there are things that are worth fighting for, that the Christian values that we have lost had real meaning. And I'm trying to use modern topics as the influences today to remind people of these values and how they ought to be applied. Well, there's no doubt that Christian civilization is under attack. Are you optimistic? Are you pessimistic? What, what do you think is the outlook for believers and for civilized society? I think it'll get a lot worse before it gets better. I think that there will be a lot of society that will crumble, and it has to, because we're trying to base uh, society on something of a, somewhere between nominalism and relativism, and you can't do that. And so that's why we're in a situation where people don't know what a man is anymore, what a woman is anymore. And when you get into that situation where there's no grounding whatsoever, it's going to, it's going to fall apart. There's literally no foundation. I do think that this is a time when Christian communities ought to be forming, that people ought to, you know, get together. And I know that a lot of that actually fell apart during the COVID years. So it takes a really conscious effort to get together with people from your parish and start to really form community again so that people can protect each other as times do get worse. I think that Christian persecution will increase, especially for those who are willing to live the faith, whether that's a, a photographer who's unwilling to take part in a faux gay wedding or something like that, you know, just as got the, the gay cake decorator and that kind of thing. I think the Christian persecution will increase. And as that happens, you need to have Christian communities that are there to support those people and catch them when they face various different types of persecution. 
that's the future, I think, is these communities that can exist even as the rest of society, the secular society that's built, as we said, on nothing, uh, falls apart. What's the role of the church in all of this? I, I go to Mass on a regular basis, and I don't hear a lot about this stuff. The pastors seem to be reluctant to attack these issues. They are, and I find that personally disturbing. I think it is the role of the church uh, throughout the ages to be a source of grounding, to provide moral instruction, even when the entire rest of the world is burning and doesn't know right from wrong. I think it is the job of pastors, the job of priests, to speak on these things, even when it is a time of persecution, even when these things seem so confusing for parishioners. It is their job to speak about these things. And I know that in some places are much worse than others, but it is absolutely the duty of the Church to speak. And then it's also the duty of individual Catholics to speak these things into the world, you know, not to remain silent and entirely divorce their religious life from the rest of themselves. You can't really do that if you truly do believe what you say that you believe. Well, how can people find out about your work and track down uh, the various videos and writings that you produce? All of my works are available at crusadergal.com. So that's crusadergal.com. You can find videos and articles there and everything that I do. Sarah Kane, the Crusader Gal, thanks very much for being with us. You are touching on topics that are delicate, that are important, that are really uh, some of the key concerns of our time. Thank you so much for having me. May God bless you and your good works. Catholics are a varied lot, and trying to reach them requires varied approaches. Fortunately, the technologies of our modern world provide ample opportunities for entrepreneurs to experiment with any number of communication efforts. One Catholic entrepreneur who's casting his bread upon the waters is Michael Snellen, founder of a multifaceted communications company called Catholicism for the Modern World. He's with us now. Michael, a scan of your website suggests that you're pursuing online publishing, social networking, discussion groups, a dating site, a marketplace. What's all this about? Yeah, all of the different aspects. I think that goes back to the convert in me. So I just converted to the Catholic Church last November. And it was really the uh, beauty, the culture, the vastness of the Catholic heritage, the tradition that really attracted me, um, coming from a Southern Baptist background. So just seeing like how the faith has really been the faith of our fathers for 2,000 years, um, there's lots there to explore. And so there's lots of ways to explore that. I think one of my favorite ways so far that I've discovered is sacred music. So I've started the sacred music branch mostly because I enjoy learning about sacred music, but it also helps spread the faith. Um, I think the early evangelists of Britain, they remarked how music was one of the main ways they were able to spread the faith. The pagans were able to memorize the hymns, right. even if they weren't able to understand what they uh, meant explicitly. They were hearing those hymns and really it was piercing their hearts. So. Yeah, there's lots of ideas. I think I have too many ideas, really, so I'm trying to simplify a lot of them. We're just starting out as a company. We'll be going the nonprofit route probably next week, registering as a nonprofit. We really started about a year ago as a blogging publication uh, that really connected writers, helped edit their work, and I saw the need for that. It was on a site called Medium.com, one of the biggest blogging sites in the world, but it really lacked an active Catholic publication. And so it grew pretty much overnight. There was dozens upon dozens of writers that were signing up and submitting articles. And so really that aspect of connecting and really collaborating has stayed with the company. So that's what we plan to do as a nonprofit company. We had success as a writing publication, but we never like had an overwhelming amount of success in any of the things we've started just yet. So that really inspired me to keep trying new things. 
hoping that one of them will really take off and benefit all of the branches, all of the aspects of the company. Because I think a lot of Catholic companies, they'll start out as a book publishing company or like a radio station, and they'll succeed doing that. So they'll never try anything new. They'll only stay doing that. But we really had a lot of failures, a lot of projects that never really took off. So it's all sort of coming together now, making a really special company. I see that one of your endeavors is actually a talent agency. How's that going to work? Yeah, so that really ties back into the connection aspect of the company. So I think like last Easter, there was a lot of volunteers coming in the company. Um, They started proposing new things that really I never considered. So of course we had that writing publication background always stored in the company, but somebody last Easter proposed that we take that and do the same idea, but for video. Uh, And so that's kind of what our streaming platform is, is the door acutest media. The two patron saints of the internet, if you put their names together and add the word media after it, it spells out I am, uh, which was kind of shocking to realize. So we plan to do like writing, video, and then once we become a nonprofit company, we hope to really connect in person businesses or in person companies, support them in any way we can. I'll give one example. There's a bookstore in the city that's run by a bunch of old people which isn't a bad thing. However, they don't really see the need for the Internet. They have a website that's not really up to date, and there's lots of potential to sell their books online or really reach a new audience with the Internet. So if we have a company that has tons of volunteers, we can pretty much offer help to a lot of companies that could use it, and we can also kind of connect them together and see what comes from that. That's where the management aspect comes from. It's clear that you're an entrepreneur in your heart. If people would like to become involved, perhaps submit material for your various outlets or get involved with your talent agency, how can they reach you? I'm pretty much on every social media platform. I believe the best way would just be to reach out through email, catholicismforthemodernworld at gmail.com. Uh, the website's also another easy way. If someone was to go on the website, they would see the contact page or they would find the email. I work at the Abbey of Gethsemane, so if anyone's ever coming down to Kentucky to visit the Abbey, they can find me in the fudge department. Michael Snellen, a new Catholic Renaissance proposed here under the title Catholicism for the Modern World, uh, an entrepreneur with all kinds of projects building, and uh, it would be interesting to follow this and see how it all develops. Thanks for taking a couple minutes to talk about it. Yeah, definitely. Thanks for inviting me on. It was great to be on your show. Be with us next time when we explore other aspects of religious communication and look deeper into the great Christian heritage of free expression. Free Expression with Bill Castle is a production of Good Shepherd Catholic Radio and Company Publications, where good books, good music, and good radio are always good company. Dan Curris provided technical assistance. Theme and incidental music are by Dan Adam. The program was produced and directed by Bill Castle. This is Good Shepherd Catholic Radio.